am uh, Susan Oleksi, and I'm going to fill in as moderator, which really means I'm going to say five minutes, two minutes. I'm not going to do much else. But um, we thought what we'd do is um, talk about different aspects of um, publishing, and we'll each take some pieces of it. But we're going to begin with um, telling you in 30 seconds or less who we are, and then how, we, how our first book was published, and then how our most recent book was published. So um, we're going to begin with Gary. Gary oh, Gashgarian. No. <laughs> okay, um, my name is Gary Gashgarian, and under that name, I am an English professor at Northeastern University, and I've been there forever. Um, and I write under the pen name Gary Braver, uh, and if anyone wants to know why, I'll explain it later on. Uh, Gary Braver fits better on the cover for one. Any case, uh, how I started, uh, I was very lucky uh, to have as my office mate at Northeastern, uh, Robert B. Parker, um, the days that even uh, Sarah goes back to. And um, Parker uh, and I became very close friends for 40 years and about third year into um, my, uh, um, my joining the English department there, uh, he and I were jogging around the track and he said, I think I'm writing a novel. And uh, he said, we started talking about it and he made it very effortless. And after uh, nine or 10 months, he had a finished product. And then he found himself an agent. And I said, if you can do it, uh, I'll try it. Um, I was chomping at the bit to write something, but I didn't have a story. Then I eventually did, did a diving expedition in Greece and it, it had run into um, black market piraters who attacked us underwater. It's really James Bondy kind of thing. And I said, if I get out of this alive, I've got a story. So I went to Parker and I said, I think I got a story and it took a year or so to write the book. And he connected me with uh, someone who is, who was in his agent's agency a young guy named John Sterling, and I was with Sterling for that particular sale. And then he became uh, editor-in-chief of Holt Reinhardt, so he was no longer an agent. And then I found another agent, um, and I was with her, her for 20-something years. And the, um, the latest book um, is called Choose Me, and I co-wrote it with Tess Gerritsen, and she's got a divine agent named Meg Rooley, who represented the book and sold the book just recently uh, to Thomas and Mercer, which is a uh, mystery and thriller line for Amazon. And so I'm now with, uh, with her, um, at least on this particular book. Um, so it was very easy in the early days to get an agent. And as everyone will tell you, uh, an agent is, is the first vetting process, and they do the ugly stuff by, you know, getting contracts and talking about money with publishers. Um, and so that, back then, the process was easy, and thank goodness I'm not starting out today trying to find an agent because they get 15% of whatever they sell, and so they are financially invested, and they are almost as difficult to find as a publisher. So, so the first one you got with an, with, um, by knowing somebody, yes. Yes. Uh, and that helped and that gave me a foot in the door. And back then it really was easy. This is 19, early eighties. So it was, it was easy to get an agent and it was, and I, the book was, was nicely written. So we got on the second submission, we got a contract with a dial press, which is part of double day. Um, but it was because I knew somebody. And I think that's still at networking, Sisters in Crime, Mystery Writers of America, you get to know other people whose agents are introduced or you go to uh, mystery conventions and you meet agents and you do your pitches. So there's still, there's still contact um, possibilities. But back then it was a friend. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Um, okay, thank you. Ursula, how about you? That is 30 a, seconds of who you are. Um, and then your book. In the books, that's a tough act to follow. Um, I just wrote in chat that I have an inferiority complex all of a sudden. Oh. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I had a long and um, challenging and successful career um, in computer sciences and computer engineering, ultimately um, uh, retiring from a job as IT director at a large financial services company. So I came into writing about 10 years ago and from the creative aspect, previously it was all for engineering and uh, basically uh, breaking down um, complex issues so that uh, a lay person, a manager who's not necessarily informed of the technology could understand. So 
that's the background I, came, background I came from. And I chose this aspect of creative writing because it was something I could do anywhere, regardless of where my husband and I, who was also retired back then, um, where we landed, you know, where we vacationed, where we lived, it didn't matter, I could write. So um, into this journey, 10 years ago, start about 10 years ago, I, I took a lot of courses and um, I started writing a novel about a year in and it was extremely difficult. I didn't know what I was doing. It took a couple of years. Dale helped me out with, I can't say how many drafts. And, um, you know, it was my master's thesis. I learned a tremendous amount about book writing through that process. And when it was um, finally getting into shape after two years, I, um, you know, I began looking uh, down the traditional path that, that Gary explained. I, you know, I um, started looking at you know, lists of agents, lists of publishers, you know, figuring out whether they had published something previous that was uh, akin to what I had written and so forth, trying to come to this list, this master list of 12, you know, people to approach, people and organizations to approach. I was doing query letters and it was agonizing. It was taking months and it was driving me crazy. Um, people in my workshops were going crazy because I was going crazy. And um, a person came up to me um, a very good friend, and he said um, he had just done an imprint himself. So in other words, he had registered a company with the state of Massachusetts. He had a, um, an IRS um, a, a ID. He had a bank account. It was his publishing imprint. And he said, Ursula, let me do that book for you. So um, he edited it. I changed it. He edited it. I changed. We went through this process again. We um, contracted out to another copy editor. His very creative wife did the book cover. Together we created this book, Purple Trees. And um, it was a tremendous process. And um, my friend and I, um, you know, subsequently we did many books. I still publish under that imprint. And um, we uh, came to do courses and so forth in the, you know, the broader community of New England and so forth, teaching publishing, writing, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, after two, three, four, five, six books, you tend to figure it out. And in retrospect, looking over the material um, that I was giving to people just coming into writing, just coming into the publishing process, I thought about my own experience. And, you know, what it boiled down to me was that um, in my friend making that offer, I had someone to work with. It wasn't a scenario where I did a query letter to an agent or a publisher and they said no. I had someone who was saying yes, and we worked through that process. I don't feel it was a shortcut. It was agonizing. It, it, it was just an awful lot of work to get it right. And, um, but that is my experience. And I'm, I'm just so grateful to have had that opportunity to meet someone, to um, partner with a family and really um, get that book published and learn the process and really become a great, better writer through that whole episode. That's terrific. Thank you. Um, Sarah, welcome. And let's hear your story. 30, 30 seconds on who you are and then okay. you're publishing. I'm Sarah Smith and I, um, I write an Edwardian series um, starring Alexander von Gleisen and Perita Haley. My path to publication. Um, there is a book called The Usual Path to Publication, which is wicked funny and um, talks about the uh, hugely unlikely paths to publication involving elephants and um, the Usher Dreyer uh, breakdowns at four o'clock in the morning and things like that. Mine was that when I was a baby graduate student, I got given an undergraduate senior thesis to read, and it was about Victorian cemeteries. And I immediately recognized that this guy was a fellow soul, and I looked him up and got to know him, and um, uh, got to know his partner, and we were friends. And his name was Michael McDowell, who was later known for writing Beetlejuice. Um, so Michael had an agent, and when I wrote my first novel, I asked Michael, would you give me an introduction to your agent? 
Jane sold uh, The Vanished Child to Ballantyne, and my first five novels were published first with Ballantyne and then with Simon & Schuster, so traditionally published. Traditional publishing was great, especially back in the day. Um, I got to meet so many good and talented people and got to become friends with many of them. Editors and um, booksellers and designers and publicists, marketing people. Um, many of them are still friends. And the books did very well and they eventually got to where they were getting quite nice um, advances. And a couple of them were New York Times novels and Young Run the Agatha and everything was cool and hunky dory. And then I wrote this other book. Um, the, the new book um, was about a woman who in 1912 found out that her grandfather might be black passing for white. So she's always thought she was white. Maybe she's black. And this is 1912. Um, and I was scared of it. I was scared of the material. Um, my family is multicultural um, and includes people of color, but I'm not a person of color. So I did a lot of work to write the very best story I could and got to know the people who would, who would read it for sensitivity for me. We could not sell this book. We could not sell it with a pound of chocolate with the manuscript. Everybody looked at it and their eyes sort of bugged out. And, and the, the problem is that the, the villain in the story was one of, turned out to be one of my major series characters. So I'd actually changed the race of a major series character. And, he looked at it and said, no, 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 no. What can you like to write something else, dear? Um, two really, really good agents tried to sell this book. Nada, nothing. And I finally sat down with my agent and I said, you know, um, we could do this forever, but I really want to get the book out. And he said, you know. I make most of my money from media sales. I don't make it from the sales to the publishers. Let's do it. And immediately, it was like the whole world was saying, you really want to publish independently? Let me help you. Uh, it, was, it was difficult. And as Ursula says, there are no shortcuts. And, we came up with a really, really good package, I think. It uh, looks very professional. Um, and booksellers have told me, wow, that's an independently published book? So cool. Uh, and the, the book was published this past April 15th, Crimes and Survivors. Now, what motivates me is connecting with readers. And my most profound experiences as a writer have been when somebody came up to me and said, your book really made a difference to me. I actually had a friend who, after reading one of my mysteries, confessed to me that he had committed murder. He never told anybody about it. And the book had convinced him that he did need to tell somebody about it. And the person he chose to tell me was, was me. Uh, the person he chose to tell was me. And, you know, that was a profound gift to me that he had, he had trusted the experience that he got for the book that much that he was willing to share that. Well, you've given and, us a theme to come back to Sarah, cause that's a yeah. really important story. And I, and I think we, um, 
I can see others nodding. So I'm thinking, yes, we want to come back to this. So thank you. That was wonderful. Um, my story is not so grand. Um, I'm Susan Olexi, and I publish three mystery series. Um, and there's a reason for that. Um, but my first book, um, I had, I uh, had was for many years a freelance editor and ghostwriter. Um, I taught as an adjunct, um, but I, I really wanted to write, and I was always writing, mostly non nonfiction, all nonfiction. And I did some fiction, but not seriously. I was very busy um, writing nonfiction and, um, you know, finishing graduate school, the whole thing. And then um, I was working on a first novel, a mystery, and I was talking to one of the editors I worked with, and he was very interested in it. And I thought, well, I'm glad he's, I'm glad somebody's interested in this. And he said, you know, we have a, a colleague here who's, who's trying to set up business as an agent. Um, she's working full time, but she also wants to be an agent. So when I finished it, I sent it to her and she said, well, I want to represent you. And I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. My first book. And, um, because I'd had some experience going to the to meetings at the National Writers Union um, and some uh, conferences, I knew a bit about contracts. So um, she gave me a contract, and I said, "Well, no, I'm going to give you a contract that, that matches what you know the various authors' organizations say it should be." And uh, so I, I was glad I had that savvy. And um, so she uh, took it on, and. Um, Simon, uh, I'm Scribner's bought it and gave, a, gave me a three book contract. And that was in 1993. It seems very easy and in, in many ways it was. Um, we, um, she sent it around to six editors and after Suzanne Kirk at Scribner's didn't answer and didn't answer, it took 12 months for her to answer. And, and my agent had basically written her off. And then she called, Suzanne called, I think the night before Valentine's Day and said, is the book still available? And I, I said, yes. And she said, good, let me talk to your agent. And I said, great, I'll have her call you. Well, my agent was in the Bahamas getting to know her new mother-in-law. And uh, we did manage to work it out. And then most recently, um, my third series. Now, th the reason I have three series is I've had three publishers and they've all gone through this phase of we're done with mysteries or we're done with cozies, or we're done with this, or we're done with that, and the whole line shuts down. Well, that's what happened with my most recent book, which came out from Midnight Inc. Does everybody remember Midnight Inc.? That's right. And um, they bought two books and then announced that they were no longer doing mysteries and gave me back the rights. But um, the book is still out there. They did, keep the, they did keep that book, and they are still promoting it. Um, so I, my my um, third series, but my 12th book is um, uh, set in a New England um, farm community with a new series. And um, I, you know, I wrote it, gave it to my agent. And one of the editors who read it said, I like it, but I don't like this part of it. There's a sort of paranormal, um, she's, a, she's a face healer. And um, so, so uh, her comment was, I should take it out. So my agent said, take it out. So I took it out and then, uh, you know, fixed up the, new, this, the second book in the series. And an editor at Midnight Inc. got both of them. And she said, oh, I like that faith healing stuff. So I put it back in the second book. And she bought both books. And um, that's the series that lifted off and didn't fly for long, very long. So, so, but once again, it was because I, I had been going to conferences I knew the woman who became my agent, um, and I, um, I liked her. I saw what she did. Now, in between these two, the first agent and then this current one, I, I thought, well, I need a new agent because I left my first agent. And I did do the process of interviewing people and writing letters to agents that I thought would make good representation. And I did get an agent that way. But she was new and she never sold anything for me except one short story. Um, and I, I liked her and I thought she was very capable, but she didn't sell mysteries. And I really think you need to know who is in your field and who does, who works in your genre, who has contacts and, and knows what the editors are looking for. Um, because, you know, I knew a little bit, but 
your agent knows so much more. And really, um, I, it, it was because of my new agent, somebody I knew who understood mysteries, who was interested in the genre. So, you know what I'd like to do now is move on to our, our second question. We came up with a series of questions and we're each picking one or two. And, um, this, and Ursula was gonna talk about short stories. Yes, I can talk a little bit about short stories. If they're different or not from publish, in publishing issues around short stories. Yeah, um, so um, in listening to all of you, I, 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 you know, there's a lot on the traditional track. So um, I have less on the literary side, maybe a little more on the, you know, online um, e-magazine side, but one literary um, organization that I, have come across um, is craftliterary.com. Um, there's several arms to it that do um, uh, their workshop, uh, not workshops, their um, contests, their submissions, all sorts of things. But it is a first-rate organization for for stories, for short stories. Um, for a, a, another uh, way, where a uh, place to find. Um, where you can uh, market or try to sell your short story is a submission grinder. It's called The Grinder. Um, uh, if you just uh, Google search for submission grinder, you will come up to the URL, but uh, The Grinder is the, the, the actual part of the URL. This is an um, offshoot of the old Duotrope, um, which has gone subscription. Um, so basically what this is, uh, The Grinder is a, you know, it's a front end to a big database of um, online magazines and resources that you can look at. Um, you can parse them relevant to a genre and you can see um, what magazines exist, what online resources exist, and you can see how many grinder people have published within that resource or magazine over a period of time. So that can be very, very useful. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is that uh, Flash fiction has a very large market right now. Um, now, definition of flash fiction varies for some of these uh, online magazines, these online publications. It can be, you know, maybe the ballpark is 500 words, but sometimes there are flash fiction um, uh, calls out for um, flash fish, fiction pieces of 100 words, 200 words. Um, there's one that I, I think it's 10 words. Um, I, 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 I saw it a couple of years ago. I don't know if they're still in business, but that's a, that's a challenge. Um, so flash fiction is a good thing to keep in mind. And I think, you know, in, in the course of doing this, I mean, you know, we haven't talked a lot about rejection. So let me, let me put my hand up there. Um, re rejections are part of life. I mean, um, part of the literary life, part of the traditional life, part of the independent publishing life, um, and, you know, get used to it. They're, they're proud scars. And, you know, persist, you will find somebody to publish your work. And I find that getting back to basics always helps. Um, in my own case, um, again, I've been writing for 10 years, which is nothing. But um, I've been seriously taking on this, um, this task of learning how to, you know, become a good writer. And um, going back to basics, this summer I took a short story course. And it was, it was an int introductory course. It was one of the most valuable things I ever did because it reminded me of what that, that type, that literary type is all about. And... Um, I think that's a good thing to do as you go forward with your stories, go back and, you know, think about them, go down to basics, practice your jump shot, you know, don't get the fancy shots, still practice the basics. And, um, you know, keep an eye on literary uh, sources and non-literary sources, genre publications for, for uh, short stories because um, they come and go, but um, there are a lot of them out there. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about anthologies. Um, uh, I, in, in, in teaching courses through various organizations, um, Sisters in Crime, uh, the Seven Bridge Writers Collaborative, of which I'm a member, um, I've come upon many groups of people who collaborate, writers that collaborate to do a, a self-published anthology. They tend not to sell so well, but they are a great way to gain experience, 
to really get a good working relationship with other writers and they're great resume builders. So um, you can go to Amazon, you type your name and you come back with, you know, one, two, three, four, this growing list of credentials. It's a, it's a tremendous thing. And it's also good if you want to switch over, you know, um, however you're publishing right now, traditionally or independently, switch to the other side. It's, um, it's good for your resume and it, um, it shows that you can build a, um, a following, which also can be valuable. So um, I hope that's useful. Um, short stories, how to go forward with them through the grinder. Keep at it. Think a bit. Think about basics and don't give up. Everybody gets the rejection letters. Well, Ursula, you have given us a beautiful segue into um, our third question, which was about um, self-publishing. Have you tried it? And I think, Sarah, you were going to talk about this, and then I'm going to say a little bit. So jump okay. right in, Sarah. So I, I did, I did um, publish my most recent book, Crimes and Survivors, myself. And I stupidly decided I was going to go into self-publishing by publishing, uh, republishing the other three books in the series. So I also decided I was going to learn how to do each of the steps in self-publishing. So I learned how to do covers. I learned how to do interior design. Um, read a lot and found out a lot about pub uh, publicity and marketing. Didn't do all of the publicity myself that, um, and I had people who looked at the books and the covers for me who were better than I were, uh, Les. But I learned that was involved in each of these steps. Whether or not I publish um, traditionally the next time or, or publish uh, independently again, now I have this knowledge and any knowledge about the business is great. You should get um, craft knowledge, you should get publishing knowledge, you should get publicity knowledge as much as you can. Uh, a group of us started a, um, a workshop that meets uh, about once a month about publicity and publicities. Dale Phillips, who is in this class, is a stalwart of it. And we tell ourselves more. And then I realized that, speaking of anthologies, I had a group of anthologies and novels that I had appeared in Lilev that they'd been written by various members of my writing group. They were all out of print. And there was one of them that had never been published. And I thought to myself, I could do this again. So without actually being a publisher, because publishers do other things like give people money for advances and um, make uh, promises for publicity that they frequently can't fulfill. Um, here I am now doing the same thing that I did for my own books, doing it for other people's books. And it's fun. Um, and it's, it's, not, it's not all that difficult. Um, I have a, um, a handout, um, the interior design of books, which you can get through writing me at my website, www.sarasmith.com. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I was going to say a little bit about uh, self-publishing because back in um, 1998, a friend and I founded the Larkham Press um, to publish the Larkham Review, which is a literary journal. And I, um, my, when she asked me to do this with her, I said, okay, but we have to have a mystery story in every, in every issue. And um, and uh, there were lots of discoveries in this process. One, um, this was before pod, before print on demand. So we had to, we had to um, hire, a, find a printer that we liked and could work with. This is such a big deal. I understand why publishers have their favorite printers. And if there's a choice of, be, of taking the writer out to lunch or the printer, they're gonna take the printer. A good printer is you know, fabulous. Um, anyway, we, we found a very good printer we had a design, um, we hired a designer who gave us a couple of templates, we made a choice. And, um, and then we sent out a call for, for stories and poetry and essays. 
we were deluged with poetry. I do not think of the United States as a nation of poets, but apparently we are. Um, essays were really thin and lots of short stories. And most of them were not ready for publication. Some were, a few were terrible. And then there were a few gems, some really wonderful pieces. Um, but I wanted interviews, mystery, short fiction, essay, poetry. I wanted everything. And I wanted black and white art. So we went along this way. And then we did five uh, mystery novels. And um, uh, one of our first uh, publishers is on this list, uh, published writers is on this list, Leslie Wheeler. We did her first mystery. And, um, and, and then we went broke because we were, we had to print a certain number of books. And then Pod came along. We would have had to quit anyway. I, I always make that point because my, my partner got cancer and my mother got very sick. So we had claims on our time. But before we stopped this, I said, you know, I want to do an anthology of short crime fiction. And so out of that, with two other friends, grew Level, Level Best Books and the annual anthology of Level Best Books. By now, I was sure I knew everything. You know, I'd been through the mill. I'd been, been down to hell and back. Um, nevertheless, working with Pod was different. It was, a, it was a lesson, but it was easier than, you know, all the other stuff. And it was a wonderful experience. It was, it was just wonderful. Um, we had a good printer in the beginning and now they, now they do pod, which makes it much simpler. Choosing the stories was a great experience. Um, and it's a very personal process. And I, one of the things I learned is that when you get a rejection that says it's really not something we can use right now or it's not quite right for us, they're telling you the truth. I, the number of times I had to say that and I, my heart ached for the writer because you know, the story was good. It just wasn't right for us. And I know that some people were quite miffed at that and have never forgiven me for, you know, turning down their story or turning down their essay. But in fact, I had a vision for the Larkham Review. I had a vision for the Level Best Books anthology. And it, it's not that your story isn't good, it's that it doesn't fit within that vision. So as much as I hated saying no to certain things, I still had to. And so it makes it much easier for me now to accept rejection. I still think the editor's wrong, but nevertheless, you know, I understand where they're coming from, having been through that experience. So I, I, um, I, I think one of the best things any writer can do is try to sit on the other side of the desk Try to get a sense of what it means to get this manuscript over the transom or whether you've the agent has requested it or not, and look at it from somebody else's perspective. Get a sense of where do you fit in the scheme of crime fiction, and are, are you really achieving what you think you are? What does, the, what does the agent say? What does the editor say? And try to expand your thinking to include that view and think, okay, Suppose the agent is right. Suppose the editor is right. What does that mean? It really helps to get as much broad experience as you can. And I think, um, I think other people, I think also, I think Gary has had some experience with editing. Um, and, and I think, why don't you take over from here okay. on this topic? Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I teach a, uh, I, I've been teaching fiction writing workshop at Northeastern for 30 something years. And I've taught uh, elsewhere in America and in Europe. Um, and I started a fiction writing workshop in London called the London Writers Workshop in the late 80s. And um, I also um, was a freelance editor for a small startup publisher in Boston a long time ago called Hill and Company. And they had a unique um, contract offering. And because I knew Parker, he was a close friend. Um, and I knew Stephen King because uh, he plugged my first novel. Um, I went to them with this contract offer. Um, it was a contract worth $5 million for one book yet unwritten um, and no paperback, paperback deal will be separate beyond that. Um, and be 27% um, of the, of the retail price. And as many of you know, um, 
from zero to 10,000, it's you know 10% and 10,000 to 15,000, it's 12 and a half percent. And if you sell over 15,000 books, you get 20, uh, you get 15% of the of the uh, list price. And this was like 27%. It was just a huge contract. And when I called King, I, Parker was not interested. When I called King, he said, you know, this is really very attractive, but you missed me by three days. New American Library just offered him $34 million. <laughs> uh, and my first reaction was, you know, God. And secondly, how could they possibly earn back? He said, I don't give a damn. If they're dumb enough to give me this kind of money, I'm, I'll be smart enough to take it. Um, what I learned from um, that experience um, as an editor, at, freelance editor, while I was still teaching at Northeastern, uh, at Hill and Company, I was getting all sorts of manuscripts coming in, and many of them were not very good. I even got one from Gregory McDonald, who back then had written very successfully the Fletch novels, and at least three of them had become uh, movies with a uh, Chevy Chase. Um, and they're, they're, the, the Fletch novels are brilliant. They're like very well designed oriental carpets. Everything has everything is connected. It's overall design. It just was, it was brilliant writing. And he sent me a book that was not so brilliant. It was not a Fletch book. Um, it was very talky. Uh, it was very uh, self-conscious. Um, it was, it needed a lot of work. And here I am with this, you know, thousand pound canary who's made an awful lot of money and is very successful. He was honored in Mystery Writers America you know, many times. Um, and I was, had to say to him, this needs work. And so what I learned from that was that everyone, even the pros, need some help. Mm -hmm. That sometimes they get wrapped up in themselves, they have too many adverbs, um, too many long drawn out descriptive scenes that really have no spike of activity or drama. Uh, the characters needed some work to fleshing out some more. Um, and so here we are with brilliant New York Times best-selling author and a few others I had too, uh, Martin Cruz Smith, and you go sideways to Northeastern where I'm teaching a course, I had been teaching a course in fiction writing of the short story. And I eventually said, short stories don't sell kids think big. That's very cynical on my part. And so I started teaching for the last 20 something years, start your own novel, write the novel you've always wanted to write, get the first two slam dunk chapters or opening chapter and a subsequent chapter. It could be the one that always you, you thought of when you thought of this concept of a novel where, the, where all, the, all the forces come head to head. Uh, a synopsis and some rewrites of those chapters and a synopsis. And what I learned is, particularly at the young level, one out of, it, it caps at 15. I'm doing it again, it's coming next month. It caps at 15 and be one student in it has the talent. I can take a mediocre writer and make them good. I can't take a good writer and make them brilliant or make them great. One out of those 15 every semester has a potential for literary greatness or someone who could who has the belly fire who has the literary talent and can if she or he has the time eventually after they get out of school come back to those pages and if the belly fire is there finish the book um, but it really is hard and everything from cabbies or or um, you know wait staff I could write, I should write a book about that. Well, <laughs> it's very, very hard. I've got nine novels and each one was a grind. I have no series like you know, my colleagues here. Um, and every time I'm starting from zero, it's like getting fired. You have to come up with a whole new cast of characters, a whole new storyline. And then you have to work at an, on an arc and a character arc and you have to know immediately that's what I tell my, my students, know exactly what your protagonist wants and know exactly what those dangers are to the realization of those desires and give them help, give them spikes of disappointment all the way through. So um, that's what I learned. It is very hard, very difficult, um, and most people can't do it, which is good for us. But Gary, um, I have a question. Go right ahead, Chris, yeah. I have a question from, uh, from Connie. If every, oh, okay. editor, if every editor will bring his or her own opinion to your work, what do you recommend for finding the voice that works best for your work? Uh, knowing what the work is and where it's going to go, um, I always recommend, in terms of voice, that, that brings up point of view. Now, it's through whom are you going to tell the story? If it is a mystery or a thriller, I recommend the character with the most to lose. 
because mysteries and particularly thrillers, thriller is driven by dread. Mysteries are about you're solving a, a, a puzzle, getting the, you know, the, putting together all the clues and nabbing the bad person at the end. But if it's a, if it's a thriller, which is driven by dread, that's an emotion. So the person has the most to lose means that the reader is emotionally bound to that person and rooting for him or her. Uh, and, and that is what something, look at any major thriller and you, you'd see, I mean, any Stephen King novel, any Patterson novel, and uh, Tess Gerritsen novel, you'll see that the person who has the most to lose is the one you care about and, and that is her or his story. Um, and so for someone trying to get a voice, think of that person and why that voice has to exude um, some kind of sympathy so the writers can attach to that, that character. Yeah. I don't know if that really answers that. It's, it's a large question, but I, I, yeah. maybe the, the, the person who asked the question, you know, could, could get a better sense of where to go with that. Ursula, um, do you want to weigh in on this and then Sarah? <clears throat> Oops. Sarah, would you like to go first? I'm still collecting my thoughts here. I'm finding okay. myself so mesmerized by what you all are saying. I'm taking <laughs> um, um, let me I, let me add a let me add a ahead. couple of things. Um, first, about point of view, it's always the person to whom it matters most who should tell the book or sometimes the scene. You can have a book with multiple points of view and it's always the person who is going to hurt the most, who can gain the most, or who can lose the most, who should be telling that particular part of the story. And the other thing is about um, when you take editorial advice. Most of us, I imagine, are members of writing workshops. We have our beta readers. Um, typically, 90% of what a beta reader, reader says to you is, you should do this, and you go, no, don't think so. Um, and then there's that 10% that will really change the book for the better. And your job as the writer is to say yes to that 10% and no to the rest of it. And sometimes people will give you um, a way in which you should change this to make it better. Don't necessarily li listen to the way they want you to change it, but listen to what they have to say about their reactions and proceed accordingly. That's what I've got. Ursula? Yeah. yeah. Connie, um, I've read your books and you, you definitely have a voice. Um, I haven't been schooled like the other members on this panel, but what I find from my readers is that you know, regardless of point of view about delicacy of craft, unless I'm really writing um, from a very fundamental, either a passionate or a, a, an angry or a, some kind of emotion, readers can tell. They can tell when it's flat. They can tell when it's not genuine. I think Combining that, um, Gary called it fire belly, I think, belly fire. Um, combining that with um, your core story, you know, that's the voice, getting the passion and the, the, the telling of this story, this particular sequence of events. And I think everything else can be edited in or out or whatever, but I think that's the key. Um, just can I cut in? Can I just, yeah. Uh, just secondly from uh, what Ursula was saying. Um, one of the things that creates that passion, and this is, this is what I discovered from being an editor and, and having taught workshops forever, um, is that the old, you all know this chestnut, show, don't tell. And that passion, if you could dramatize that passion, um, everything is simple, like, it's simply such as, instead of saying she was angry, she slammed her hand on the table or threw the coffee cup against the wall, which demonstrates anger without using the word anger. That, that dramatizing of, of the emotions is something readers can identify with, something we've all felt. So I think that is a key thing that separates the scribblers from the authors, those who've made it. And um, any decent novel that you've, that you've read it, you, the the passion that you're talking about, Ursula, ex exactly is shown on the page, um, where you can feel the emotion. You, 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 you choke up 
You don't choke up when someone says, I feel sad. <laughs> you choke up when there's a yeah. demonstration of sadness, traumatized. Yeah. There's um, an exercise I used to give um, students when I was teaching um, to help them with point of view. And you know, they'd come in with a story idea and I'd say, okay, how many characters are in this story? And they'd say three or four that they wanted to have in the story. And I'd say, all right, write the story from the opening paragraph or page from the, from the point of view of each one of these characters. And then rewrite it from the point of view of first person or third person. Mm -hmm. And there are times and, um, you know, I uh, first person is something I've I struggled with, and really worked at it. And you know, it's not it doesn't work for me. I mean, it, yes, I can get eighty thousand words, but I'm not sure I like those eighty thousand words <laughs> or the way it works. But the minute I switch to third person and I'm doing a rewrite now, I can feel the story opening up in ways I had not anticipated. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure we're different. You know, all of us are different some points of view really work for some writers and others don't and the you know the same thing for for all of us we have to find that point of view that really comes out of a much deeper part of us that we we hear we hear a voice we understand it and we follow it and we trust it and if we trust it when we're writing the reader trusts it as as he or she is reading um but you know, you have to be willing to waste a lot of paper and a lot of time finding oh, that yeah. point of view. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yes. The delete key is your friend. Can I, can I add another um, exercise? Catherine Neville and I used to teach at um, Book Passage in Corte Madera. And we would start our, um, our course on feeling passion in your writing by asking everyone to write down the one thing that they could not write about. Hmm. And then we would take uh, a brass bowl and we would put all of these pieces of paper in the brass bowl and we would take it out to the parking lot and we would burn them. Hmm. That now everybody knew that there was one thing that they could not write about that they had written about. And it was, a, it was a freeing exercise. Sometimes you'll read a book and you'll feel like it's not the characters who are, who are holding back, it's the author who's holding back. Never, 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 never hold back. Mm. Yes. Write down yes. that, that uh, sentence and then you can burn that piece of paper. Yes, yes. Okay, I mean, really that's, um, I think that's all good advice and um, I'm wondering if um, maybe we should try one of one of the questions that um, that we were going to talk about is the backstory because you know we've talked about so much about how now getting into this story, finding the point of view, um, and working with it. And one of the things is a lot of stories, a lot of our novels have a, a backstory that doesn't actually get into the novel. How did you come to write this particular story? What drove you? The, um, this one had to be written. And it's not, not necessarily a, you know, a personal drive of, you know, I'm, I had to exorcise this feeling, whatever. Sometimes it's something quite different. And um, I noticed that everybody has, has responded to that question when I sent them out on email. Everybody's, you're, you're, I could tell everybody's light bulbs going off. Oh yes, that story or that novel. So let's talk about that. Um, who would like to jump in and tell their- gotcha. uh, yeah. Go ahead, Gary. Um, At a Christmas party two years ago um, at the um, um, uh, Mobile Book Fair, sorry, um, Tess Garrison was given a Robert B. Parker Award, and she's been our friend for 20 something years. And we were talking, what are you writing? What are you doing? And she said, uh, maybe it's a glass of wine she was drinking. Would you like to write a book with me? <laughs> I said, give me a nanosecond. Um, and I, I said, sure, absolutely. And it was what was in the air, of course, is the, the Me Too, um, um, you know, uh, newsworthy, the movement, let's try to say, I would say it was newsworthy, it was just hot. And so we kicked around an idea while we were at the bookstore. And she said, she, because Jacob, her husband, is an amateur uh, astronomer, astronomical photographer, uh, we thought about, you know, that. And I said, ah, I don't feel comfortable with astronomy. I'm going to get into the weeds and stuff. So I said, um, 
how about a college professor having an affair with a student? You know, that old thing again. So. Yeah. And so the backstory of this is uh, about, a, about a six months before we agreed to do a book together. And I'm teaching a course in modern bestsellers. And I was doing Gone Girl, um, which I think is a very smart book and very well put together, I mean, aside from, you know, what you, all the stories about in the movie. Um, and I was teaching the book um, and I got an email from the Title IX person at Northeastern University that students, two students in the, in the class have filed a complaint against me. And I could not imagine what it was, what to specify. So I got an email. So I called the woman thinking this was a hoax. And lo and behold, there was this person who was actually a man, a person, the one in the book, a person who was in, in charge of the Title IX and, um, and Compliance Office at Northeastern, a fairly new office back then. So I walked in, felt like a, ca a character out of a Kafka story, you know, uh, um, where I'm going to go there and get, get in, and be executed for something I didn't know what I did. So I walked in and um, I cut to the chase. I said, why am I here? What did I do that offended someone in class? And she said, you were talking about Gone Girl and you said that you could understand how a professor could have an affair with a student. I said, no. I said, I could understand how Jillian Flynn's character as defined would, who has a bad relationship with his wife at home can pick up with one of his students. And she said, oh, and then I, we started talking about the movie. And I said, you, you didn't read the book, did you? No, but you remember the movie, it was the Ben Affleck character, you know. Um, and, you know, it's uh, back home, there is, you know, his, his wife, uh, Rosamund Pike, is, is sulking in her ha unhappiness living in this podunk town in the Midwest, uh, having come from, you know, the highly electric you know, corners of New York City. And so I explained that to her and said, okay, so drop out charges. And uh, she had interviewed a lot of other students anonymously in class and they said, this is a ridiculous charge. So I said to Tess, how about this? And so I wrote that, wrote an opening scene that had, you know, this guy, the professor is called the class and that became the Ramana I collect a launch into this novel. And uh, it, it's about, it, it starts off in, Tess wrote the female chapters, I wrote the male chapters. I wrote the professor chapter, English professor chapter, and she wrote the victim, female victim chapters, as well as the female homicide cop um, who was investigating the death of this girl in the opening scene. So I'm not giving anything away. Um, and it was, um, it was an amazing experience. Uh, I had never done this before. And you were talking earlier, Susan, about first person and third person. So Tess said, why don't we do this in first person present? I had never done first person. I had never done present before. All my books are third person. So we wrote the whole book in first person present. <laughs> I'm glad so I'm not said, the only one. Oh, oh, you're not, Susan. So we did right from, you know, T equals zero, rewrote the entire book <laughs> in the third person. She wrote the cop chapters in present, but in first person and, uh, uh, yes, and all the rest of it was third person. Uh, and uh, the conversion was not as bad. It maybe took about you know, two or three weeks. So you have to use substitute, you know, he for I and all that stuff. Um, but it became, it, it, you know, it was easier because I was, I was used to the third person point of view. But the, um, the, the, the it really did come from that particular experience. And I'm so oh. glad we didn't do an astronomy story. And, and, <laughs> and then T Tess said, I had this vision of the male and the female, and she is uh, performing an autopsy and their hands touch. He's a homicide cop and they feel sparks. Jeez, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> you write the autopsy books. <laughs> and so it was just a matter of finding, you know, finding topics the that could be, yeah, yeah. And I know the, I know the college scene, I know students, and you know, so it yeah. worked out. And it's called Choose Me and it comes out uh, a, a year, next June, next June, Good. 2021. Good. Good. Um, Ursula. Okay, you don't have to, but I thought I didn't want you to get marginalized. I wanted to bring you back in. Um, no, no, um, thank you. I wanted to mention something about backstory uh, with respect to historical fiction. So I do historical fiction. It's about East, primarily Eastern Europe, about from the Soviet occupation during World War II onto modern day, modern political issues and so forth. But 
backstory is a great way um, to um, convey a tremendous, um, not backstory, history. Characters who live okay. through history can provide a tremendous. You want to go downstairs, okay? Go ahead. Characters who um, live through history can provide a tremendous amount of information, um, which is not quite backstory, but it's still historical context. And um, that's one great way to um, really convey what can be very boring information. Um, but to, uh, so the Soviets occupied Lithuania during World War II. Putting that in the context of, of a family can give backstory for a series as well as emotional attachment and um, bring that history alive. So I'm kind of twisting the backstory idea to really convey historic okay. elements, but I think that's one thing that a lot of people, especially in Sisters in Crime, write about um, historical mystery. And, um, you know, I think it's a, a very, um, you can, you can through historical fiction and characterizing the history, really convey a lot of uh, very basic information and very useful information. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sarah, you, you I'm, I'm sure you've got a backstory. I'm sitting here nodding and saying, yes, historical fiction is a, is a way of uh, writing about the present as well as about the past. And so I told you that my family is multicultural, that we have people of color in it. And when my niece was growing up, my, my niece um, who is African-American, she would come back with these stories and we would listen and say, oh, isn't that horrible? But you know, we weren't really listening. We weren't really hearing what her experience was like. And as, um, the the whole experience of Black Lives Matter and the issues of racism in America became more front and center. I realized how much it had hurt her that we weren't understanding, we weren't listening, and we were her family. Um, so I was writing this book about Titanic. Um, and came across the, the piece of information that black people weren't allowed aboard Titanic. Mm. Nobody, supposedly. There were actually four, four black people aboard Titanic. And I thought, oh no. At the same time, I was realizing that my, that a major point of view character was going to be this person whose experience was was of being white and who now had to get used to the idea or become become um, acclimatized to the idea of being black in America. So that's that's where that story came from, and that's where a lot of the passion that, as uh, Gary says, the the belly fire that made me feel, I gotta write this book. I don't care who wants it, I want it. I've gotta get it out. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, well, I have a backstory, but <clears throat> excuse me, it's not nearly as exotic as everybody else's. Um, I, um, as a writer, one day I ran out of paper. I mean, can you imagine on a Saturday morning and I didn't have any paper. And this was the mid nineties and um, we didn't have 24 hour staples. And I, uh, it was Saturday morning. I thought, well, maybe somebody's open. And I found, I found this um, business called Ultra Fine Papers. And I called them and I said, um, are you open? He said, well, I, we're not really open today. It's Saturday, but I just came in to do some business. What can I do for you? And I said, well, I'm out of paper. I need to buy some paper. And he said, oh, well, come on down. <laughs> so it was in a section of um, the town where I live that I didn't recognize. It was behind another bunch of storefronts. And I drove in there and there was all of these little businesses. Well, little businesses. I saw their doors and there were small doors. And um, so I went in and, and it was sort of a grubby place. And I thought, oh, well. And uh, so I went in this sort of warehouse hallway and I found the office and he greeted me and he said, what would you like? And I said, um, can I have a ream of white paper? And I'm looking around thinking, where's the store? 
and he opened this door into this giant warehouse of paper. <laughs> and he said, and he pulled out a ream and he said, will this do? And I said, oh yeah. And I said, how much is it? And he said, I don't know, we don't sell retail. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay. And I said, well, I usually pay whatever it was. And so I gave him $3, I think it was at the time. And he looked at it and he said, well, I'll put it in the coffee coffee till. So he pulled open the desk drawer of this beat up desk and he put the money in and closed it up. And, I, and he said, you know, we make the best paper in the world in this country. And I thought, oh, well, that's nice. And I, I thought, I'm in a warehouse buying a ream of paper. He's an awfully nice guy. He, you know, he said, we don't get customers, but I'm always glad to help. I thought it was just charming. So I went home and, you know, printed out whatever it was. And I kept thinking about that. We make the best paper in the world in this country. And I called him back a few days later. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, we make the best paper in the world in this country. <laughs> and, I, and he said, you that know. That clarified it. <laughs> yeah, I know, just in case I didn't get the message the first right. three times. And he said, you know, if you want to know more about it, I can give you some names. And he gave me the name of a paper dealer, um, a broker, a paper broker, and a paper salesman. And I called him. And he was a young man um, in his 30s. And his, his job was selling paper. And uh, I said, this sounds, you know, he, he, he told me what he did and everything. And, and um, I said, well, this sounds interesting. And how'd you get into it? And, and he, said, he said, well, I was lucky. I roomed with, a, with the son of a man who owns a paper mill because otherwise it's like the old guild system. If you aren't born into it, you're not getting into it. He said, but the, I used to go home with him on holidays because my family didn't live in the area and they liked me. And after you know, four years, they got to trust me. And so eventually they were willing to you know, think about giving me a job. He said, but it's closed, it's a closed system. And he was wonderfully open. He told me all sorts of things. He said, if you wanna see how it works, there's a wonderful mill here in Massachusetts. And he told me about, I didn't realize how all the paper mills, crane paper, which makes our money. So the big scandal when Bush wanted to have it made overseas, which of course is ridiculous, you don't send your currency overseas. Um, it's just down the street from us, so to speak. It's just down on Route 2. And he said, go out to Esleek. It's an old mill. They do wonderful work, but they're really set up and looking like they did 100 years ago. So I went down and asked for a tour and got a wonderful tour. And out of that grew the fourth Middle Mellingham book, uh, Friends and Enemies. And um, of course, I gave it to my family to read after it came out. It did fairly well. And my mother's one reaction was, How'd you learn so much about the paper industry? <laughs> that was a great I really, book. I loved uh, the detail about paper. Thank you. I mean, I really did learn a lot about industry in this country and um, Massachusetts Rust Belt, mm. but the paper industry in this, in this state is something to be truly proud of. And we really do make the best paper in the country. So. Susan, um, I have a, um, from, from Sarah, she asks uh, that place down near the Museum of Science, and she was there, it's amazing. And Dale is inquiring about Dunder Mifflin? Dunder Mifflin? <laughs> oh, Dunder, <laughs> Dunder Mifflin, they're, I think they're paper brokers. I don't know, yes, I don't know exactly the office. So um, is that what Dunder, I know, I know it's based on Houghton Mifflin, but they're mm -hmm. not actually publishers. They weren't publishers, were they, in that, in that TV show? Oh, he says it's from the TV show, The Office. Yeah, yeah, Dunder Mifflin, yeah. Um, but I didn't know that they were publishers. I thought they were the paper people. Um, yeah, but, paper company. And we were too busy listening to the jokes to find out what they really did all day. <laughs> um, so anyway, I, I know we're coming not quite down to the wire, but we should be looking in that direction. And um, Ursula had come up with a really good um, subject to introduce here. And I'm wondering, Ursula, if you, if you want to talk about um, author branding. Yeah, um, let me say a few words about that. Um, is, is again, as I'm taking notes, I'm getting on the internet, I'm looking up everybody's uh, <laughs> website and um, every, everything is, is tremendous. Um, I want to talk about this because in 
I, I do get out, well, I used to get out a great deal. Now I Zoom a lot, but yeah. um, I meet a lot of people and I meet writers who are just starting out. I meet writers who have had wonderful careers as writers. And I've seen both cases where the, the new folks and, and you know, people who have been around who have five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 books under their belt, no website, minimal internet presence, and it breaks my heart because um, I think that no matter where you are in this industry right now, whether you publish traditionally or independently or whether you just sell your stories, some type of um, internet presence is mandatory. And this, and this begs the question, so if you are on the internet, who are you as an author? What is your brand? And um, I wanted to talk about that a little bit in terms of um, minimal work uh, that uh, kind of establishes your presence. Um, a website, um, an email list, a business card. I know Dale uh, Phillips is on the um, is listening in. I have never seen so someone give away so much uh, a, a, a paper material. Um, he has these uh, um, little uh, uh, they're, they're oversized bookmarks with all of his books listed and all sorts of things. Nothing extravagant but good, simple material that make people remember who you are. But this is all basic stuff. I mean, we think about writing is, you know, writing a book, writing a story. Being a writer, I think, is um, trying to understand who you are as a writer. And I read a book recently by Dana Kay, who is a, a, a marketing specialist. Um, she does work with Sisters in Crime. And in terms of figuring out who you are as an author, I mean, it seems like an obvious question, but it's not necessarily so obvious, especially for people who are experimenting with different genre. And her, you know, quote unquote formula is to typify the, the, the works that you have done, whatever they are, novels, whatever, to typify them in terms of the essence that you're writing about. Are you writing about families? Are you writing about uh, distressed women? Are you writing about, um, um, uh, gender issues or race issues? What is your core? Because that's really who you are as a writer. And understanding that and leveraging that not only is eye-opening, but um, it can be very impactful to your work. So um, author brand, um, I don't think that's an issue for this audience, although there's some folks on the, on the, on the, on the Zoom who I don't know. Um, and I hope that as aspiring writers, that you take um, this baseline of your internet presence very seriously. Don't just rely on, you know, Facebook and family photos. Do, an, do a Facebook page, do a business page, do a website, have business cards, um, think about your genre, try to figure out who you are fundamentally as a writer. Um, it's very basic stuff and we all should be doing that. Thank so, you. Dale suggests trifolds. Uh, listing all the books with descriptions and covers and where to buy them. He says they're, they're a great giveaway. Yeah, I personally okay. have business cards with my fate, my picture on them. And I figure, I, my feeling is that um, if people see that, they'll remember me and remember a conversation. But, you know, trifolds are great because people will use them as bookmarks mm -hmm. and um, yeah. they'll take a look at them over time. Okay. I, I have bookmarks and I took a leaf out of your book Ursula and I put my face on it, Smay, and that my feeling about uh, about bookmarks is that people keep bookmarks because they're handy things to um, to keep your place in your book until we all go completely um, electronic. And I get the heck uh, designed out of them. And um, I put, I put a little bit about the books, a little bit about the series, and um, and they're fun to hand out, and they're not so cheap, not, not so expensive that you can't hand out plenty of them. Um, you know, we've covered a lot of territory here, and I, I I'm very pleased with the discussion because I learned a lot, so I'm I've been taking notes here, <laughs> um, but I know that we didn't cover everything. Are there are there questions that? Um, um, went through your mind and you thought, oh, I'd, I'd like to say something about that because I'd, I'd love to hear 
um, if there are other things that you thought we should um, include. Um, Chris, it looks like he might have a question. I, I do. How do you, this is, this is a big thing for us booksellers, um, authors who'd like their books in our stores, the way to market their book to a bookseller. Have you ever had, do you have any um, advice on that? Um, sort of, uh, and I have my opinion of how I like to be approached, but is there some sort of um, industry standard that um, those who have, say, written their first book and haven't had it published, uh, how to yeah. approach a bookseller, how to market the book towards that bookseller to try to get it in the, into their store? Chris, have, we've got an expert one right here. We'd like to hear from you. Well, personally, me being a bookstore uh, owner, had, saying my book ranks X with X number of reviews on Amazon is not the way to start a conversation. You know, the one thing we want to hear is how's it doing in other stores? How's it being received by mm -hmm. other stores? You know, there there are a lot of independent bookstores that. Um, uh, they all have different uh, uh, ways of bringing in books. We do both consignment and if it's, um, you know, something that's been requested by a customer or um, like uh, Dale's books. When we, when we first opened uh, a couple years ago, I uh, had a, uh, one of our first customers came in and said, have you ever heard of Dale Phillips? I said, nope, but I'll look him up. When you get two or three come in like that. So <laughs> definitely by having friends and family, not just leave a review on Amazon or Goodreads, but actually mm -hmm. go into a bookstore and say, hey, we're looking for this book. Have you heard of this, this author? Mm -hmm. um, actually, just the other day, I don't know if you know Tim Cotton up in Bangor, Maine. He's an ex-police officer. Um, and he wrote a book called The Detectives in the Dooryard. And the subtitle like, escapes me. But anyways, um, somebody came in looking for it. So I looked into it. I saw that he has a great following, like somebody was mentioning about Facebook and a web presence. He has all that. He has 50 some odd thousand followers. Mm -hmm. he knows Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs. So Mike Rowe went and put um, a YouTube video out about his book. And so he's got a lot of followers. But what I did was once I found that out, I went, searched it up, looked him up, said, okay, I'll get a handful of copies. Well, I'm waiting for another 30 copies to come to me because I have 15 people waiting for copies from me because what I did was I, I put out that this book is now available. I tagged him in it. That's another thing too. If you do get your books in a bookstore, tag the bookstore. Don't just tag Amazon. You know, if you have your, your ebook, your audio book, a lot of bookstores are starting to partner with uh, other independent ebook and audio book companies such uh, like we do. Um, so, you know, if you get your book in the bookstore, I'll put it out there and I'll tag you, I'll tag the name of your book and say, you know, we just got Tim Cotton's book, blah, blah, blah. Here's the link to our website. Call us, come in and get a copy. And, uh, that was at four o'clock in the evening. The other day, the next morning, I already had 12 orders and I only had five mm -hmm. copies. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you never know, we never know when a book is going to blow up. But yeah. what he did was he shared that post that we had his book along with our link to buy the book. And that's yeah. what it did. It just yeah. blew up. So I'm sending him to South Carolina. I'm sending him to Texas, California, yeah. Ontario, Canada, Georgia, all around the country. And the book is majorly backordered. Mm. It's a small Good. press. Yeah. So Great. little things like that. Yeah. As the marketing goes. You know, don't tell me that. I, yeah, I, and I understand when we completely understand the need for Amazon. Ambro, Amazon's a powerhouse and it's going to reach a lot of people more than what I can reach. But we do have close to, if not over a thousand followers. So, yeah. you know, spread mm -hmm. the word that your book mm -hmm. is in the store. Yeah. Share yeah. our, share our, our, our posts and, and social media yeah. stuff yeah. and you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. I, I was going to say on a, on a, you know, more on a, on a little different level. Um, but part of that is that um, a bookseller told me, you know, if you have a book, don't, don't come in and tell me, you know, this is the greatest thing such, and it's this, this, and this. He said, 
tell me exactly where it fits in the genre. Right. What kind right. of story is it? Who's going who, who, who has read it? Not what kind of reviews, the Amazon reviews and the Goodreads reviews, but um, is, it, is, this, is the target audience people who read cozies? Is the target audience people who read fillers? But tell me where it fits in the, in the, in the store that I have. Right. And you know, do you know people in the area? And can you send them in to get it here? So it's be more specific about your book. Don't make it into something that it isn't. So help the, help the bookstore owner know what to do with your book, who to yeah. offer it to. So if somebody comes in and says, I want to look at Cozy's, and you'll say, well, I, this is the group that I have, and here's this new book. Yeah. Um, so you know, what, you know what you're getting. The approach, too. Don't just yeah. come in or email me or message me saying, I want you to carry my book in your store, or I would like you to carry my book in your store, yeah. and then leave it at that with an Amazon link or just a link to your website. Mm -hmm. I need yeah. that. That's the biggest yeah. turnoff right there. Yeah. 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 Like that. And it's unfortunate that, no, you're not telling me, you know, you know, come in and ask, you know, I think this would be a good fit in your store. It's about this. I mean, we've had some books too. I, I think I'm a little more lenient than, than other bookstores because one of our business, part of our business model is to really support local authors. And yeah. so, you know, I try to get, as many as I can. We're, it's a little hard right now with our budget having just reopened a little while ago. But um, we, uh, if you bring the book in and explain it to me, it, it's better to email first and say, look, I have this book. I think it'd be a good fit for your store. I looked at your website, your social media, and um, I think it would be a good fit. Uh, would you take a look at it? Um, Here's, if you want to attach a link, I do occasionally go to Amazon to see what people have reviewed and are saying about it. That's just one of the things that I use. Um, and then if it does sound interesting, I'll get in touch with you and send me more. Send me, a, send me a, uh, an advanced reader's copy if it hasn't come out yet or, or a courtesy copy so that I can read it over. I like to read the books at least yeah. part before I put them on the shelf or decide whether it's going to go on the shelf or not. Um, so the approach is, is a big thing. Don't just either come in and say, here, here's my book. I want you to put it on the shelf or I'd like you to put it on your shelf. That, that's a turnoff. Okay. Are there um, any, uh, would somebody like to add to this or more I, about- I have, a, I have a question, Chris. Mm -hmm. you, said, you said you just restarted, you reopened recently. Yep. Um, I've not been to your store and I will be someday. Um, in terms of signings, can you set up outside the store a table for authors to sign? So, yes. okay, oh, that would be, yeah, yeah, I mean, like the way restaurants have opened outside. Mm. Yeah. Yep. We um, also, we do have a gallery. We started, we started renting the space next to us, which is a big uh, 1500 square foot plus. Uh, it is a gallery. They moved out, but we're keeping it a gallery. We were able to do one big book event just before we closed down at the end of March. And so it's just mm -hmm. kind of sitting there doing nothing. Mm -hmm. but we um, have been thinking about uh, either opening that back up or having outside outside events now. Mm -hmm. that we could, uh, yeah. Start inviting people to That would be cool. That, that helps with everybody. Helps us, it helps yes. you. Yeah. Our particular yeah. store has a lot of walk-bys, uh, people walking by. Uh, not as much as before the virus. Uh, even in the dead of winter, we'd get a lot of people walking their dogs and jogging by and they'd stop. But um, not so much lately, but it seems to be getting better. Anyways, yeah. that's why we're thinking of of setting up outside. Good, Good cool. idea. Good idea. Sarah. Sarah, Sarah since yes. I, since I published right in the middle of the um, of the pandemic, and I knew that at least for a while, signings weren't going to be part of it. Um, what, I, what I did was say to people on um, Facebook and on my website and so on, if you buy a hard copy, paperback or hardbound of, of Crimes and Survivors, I will write you a personal postcard and I will mail it to you. And they have a place to sign up for that. And um, not, not as good as having a signed book, but something something that uh, was supporting independent booksellers as best I could. 
and they have to do it through an independent bookseller. Yeah, we, um, that's, now that I'm starting to get into doing the Zoom events uh, with uh, authors that we are already carry, um, and hopefully those, as we get them, we'll, I'll schedule new ones, but that's one thing that I've been asking for. We have their books and asking for, for uh, signed book plates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Plates ahead of time, and then once I make the event, and as I start promoting it, and that's the other thing too, kind of going back to if you're going to have this event, you really need to promote it. I have so much that I have to promote. I have over 2,000 plus titles that I have to promote, mm -hmm. plus getting more in every day. You've got a couple books. You have one or two events. Um, it really needs to be promoted uh, on on both ends. You know, I try to do what I can. Um, but both parties really need to to promote the events like this to get get you know the energy going for it. But anyways, I'll put in you know I have signed book plates coming. Get the book, get a signed book plate, then join our Zoom event. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, and Chris, can I ask? Are you um, taping these um, these Zoom events and putting them on your website and? Yes. Um, if you yes, can you send us a link and we can put it on our websites and yep. um, you know yep. that would be great. That would yeah, be great. I'll, I'll probably get to it tomorrow because I'll I'll cut it down the beginning portion of it um, to uh, just get the, the relevant stuff. But uh, yeah, I did that with the last one, and I sent it to everybody. So I'll send it to all you. I'll send it to Leslie for to put on the um, the Sisters in Crime page. I post it on our website. I post it on our Facebook page. And um, I'm actually gonna start now, now that I have two here and we're gonna have a third with Sisters in Crime plus pretty much uh, um, a third of September now is booked with the, some of the local authors that we already have mm -hmm. here. Uh, I'm gonna start a YouTube channel. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Venture, try to anyways, venture into that thing and, and post them on there as well. And Chris, can I add it to my YouTube channel which is called Tea Time Readings? Yep, I'll send everybody the link. Okay. And um, yeah. by the way, writers, writers here, you should read for tea time. I'm going to sign up for that, Sarah. I'm so impressed that you can do these things so quickly. I just, I mean, really, it takes me so long just to wrap my head around it. But um, I think that's a great, uh, a great service that, a thing that you're offering. I really am impressed, and I'm. I, I keep saying I'm going to sign up for it, but now that you're right here, I can tell you, yes, I'm going to sign up for it. And now I'm committed and um, yeah. we'll be in touch. <laughs> I think good. it's cool. I'll, I'll send you guys the link. Good. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Please. Good. Good. Um, maybe I should ask everybody to show up to, to show us your most recent publication and then tell us a little about um, um, what you're working on now. You know, the kind of thing that's giving you headaches, <laughs> you know. So anyway, I'll show you. My most recent book is Below the Tree Line. This is, um, you know, I've had three publishers and all three have dropped whatever. And um, so uh, Scribner's dropped its um, mystery series and went, for, went to standalone. So that was fun. And then um, Five Star dropped its mystery line. So I'd lost two series with them, Mellingham and Anita Ray. So I started a third, a third series with a fourth publisher. Um, uh, no, with a third publisher. Um, and so this is um, Felicity O'Brien, who uh, um, runs a family farm in central, <coughs> excuse me, in central Massachusetts, below the tree line. And um, the second one is <coughs> out being read, and I've got my fingers crossed that somebody will, this particular editor will like it. And I'm working on a. Um, what was a first person standalone and decided it really should be third person, which I'm doing <laughs> now. And um, I'm going to disagree a little with Gary on this because for me now it's more than changing I to she. Oh, of course. Um, of course. I'm, yeah. I, I feel like I'm, I'm read, I'm going chapter by chapter and I feel like I'm rewriting the entire chapter. And as I do this new clues come up, new lines of inquiry come up, new characters develop and it's just it's a very broadening experience mm -hmm. um and, and and i'm i'm pleased with it but my lord it's a lot of work it is yeah. <laughs> no one said this is easy no <laughs> none of this is easy. changing midstream <laughs> yeah 
So hold up a, a, a I'll, book. Um, I'll be right back. I go, go get a book. I didn't know about Gotta this. Got to go get one. Yes. I know. I'm sorry. I sprang this on everybody at the last minute. Sarah, I know you have your book. I have my book. The most recent one is Crimes and Survivors, in which a woman who has just found out she may be Black has to deal with the Titanic and um, Jim Crow in 1912. And the one I'm working on now is a big, fat um, adventure thriller set in 19th century Brazil and Europe with Ooh. pirates and sentient eagles and oh, who, whoever is going to buy this thing that everybody seems to love it and I love writing it. So we live only for pleasure now. There you go. Okay. Ursula. I'm going to cheat and show you two books. <laughs> my, my last one is Black Amber. I'm not sure if you can you see that. Yeah, Lift it sure. up a little bit. Lift it up. There, there you go. go. There you go. Yeah. Black Amber. Um, it's part of a series. Oh. Right? Um, this is a Lithuanian flag, the wheat field, the forests, and the blood. Mm -hmm. And this book is about um, a pipeline that Russia is currently building under the Baltic Sea to send uh, natural gas directly into German, Germany for pumping into the European grid. And it speculates the political consequences of someone hacking into that pipeline and stopping the flow of gas and what, what the world thinks of that operation. Do they think it's Russia? Do they think it's a hack? But the consequences of that, of that one action. So it's a it's an historical thriller, and I do Gary. I try a lot at tension. <laughs> My middle name. This is what um uh, this is Gypsy Amber, which is um it will be out in November, and this is fifth the fifth book in the series, and this um talks about Russia with her um, Central Asian neighbors and the unfortunate fact that. China is doing illegal land grabs in Central Asia, and Russia is reacting to the idea that China is in her backyard with these land grabs. And it's all of the political consequences of, of that action and what Russia might do, could do, would do to counter mm. it. So, Interesting. Mm. Gary. OK. Um, this, is, this came out a few years ago, Tunnel Vision. Um, I write medical thrillers, uh, science thrillers. Um, this is um, an attempt, it centers out a Northeastern student again, um, who, uh, um, who falls on his head in the opening chapter in a prologue and he wakes up um, several months later on Easter Sunday recit reciting the Lord's Prayer in the original Aramaic and that causes quite a stir online because a nurse, you know, with her cell phone uh, the video is this, and you know he's the miracle child, and he's an, an atheist. So what is he doing? In you know, reciting the Lord's Prayer, particularly in Aramaic. There's no place in Boston you can learn Aramaic, no graduate school, and um, he catches the interest of um, a team of neuroscientists who are trying to determine if there is such a thing as the afterlife by attempting to flatline a person and um, seeing if the mind separates from the brain in the three minutes before they, um, they, they you know, re-animate re him electrically, uh, you know, paddles to the heart and bring him back to life. And then to tell, you know, what, what has happened. And it's, it's a bizarre uh, uh, experiment, but there's simply something to it. Um, and it was dedicated to Bob Parker, um, after he passed away. Um, and, and I mentioned Choose Me, which is um, what the Tess Gerritsen and I are, have come out next, next, um, next June. I'm working on a book called Served Cold, and it's every writer's dream. Uh, if you've ever gotten a bad review by somebody and you'd like to get the reviewer, <laughs> that's what this is about. <laughs> a mystery writer who's trying to make it big. He's kind of a hack. He gets slammed in the prologue. It's the uh, prologue is actually the fictional review in the New York Times saying it ends, don't buy this book, you're dumbing down America. <laughs> and he goes after the reviewer and it's pretty Ooh. intense psychological thriller. <laughs> all right, all right. We're all gonna wanna read that one. Yeah, Served Cold, <laughs> which is the name of his book, that's not, you know, so it's a... <laughs> okay. And, but, 
Gary, real quick, um, I just wanted to say that I'm definitely interested. I'm interested in all your books. You're all sure. on my list. I actually have uh, two of Ursula's. I do do consignment. I also do um, uh, do buy the books. It depends um, on whether you know it, it'll fit here and see if it sells. But um, Ursula's are available. The first couple of them are Amber Wolf and the second one I believe I have um, on consignment. Um, five. Yep. So I'll, I'll be in touch. Yes, yes, we'll be in touch. I do need some more of at least number one, I think. But um, anyways, we'll be in touch. But I will be in touch with all of you at some point. Um, Gary, my wife, though, I will say, is a huge Tess Gerritsen fan. Great. Yes. She loves the Rizzoli and Isles series. Rizzoli and Isles, a great series. And yeah. the TV show, every day I come home and she's watching it on demand. She records every one of them. But right, for, right. <laughs> for her, anyways, looking forward to the, the collaboration with, with you and her. And, and sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we'll be down. <laughs> yes, yes. She's in, she's in Camden, Maine, so you know, yeah, on the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm in Kittery Point, Maine. Um, oh, you're really close. Yeah. All right. Um, sometimes, not all the time. Okay. Looking, looking forward, in the great time to come. Of, uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Looking for the future. Person. Hopefully, well, we can get that I don't think again because. Hopefully, we can get the gallery up and running again because we were able to get a dozen authors in there and do to do big, and that was yep. going to be my whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, so. Well, I hope we've answered every possible question, somewhere in what we've said. There's an answer for for everything. Uh, um, one more thing. Anyway. Uh, this yes. is for, for for Leslie. And if not, um, you know our names. Since we all have websites, you know where we live. Um, I do have this thing. That I see, this came in the mail today. <laughs> ah, yes. Good book. Really this good is from book. Leslie I'm Wheeler. I'm taking it to Cape with me very shortly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you'll enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Great. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And if I may, just one other, um, I don't know if you know about this avenue. Uh, have any of you heard of uh, bookshop.org? Yes. Okay. Are you on it? We are. We are a part of it. So you Excellent. can go to our website, look under... Um, uh, or just browse the uh, the book page, and if you don't see the books on there, there is the link for Bookshop to our page at Bookshop. But mm -hmm. you can also go straight to Bookshop.org, and you can search for the bookstore that you'd like to support and get to their page. And as long as your books are distributed through Ingram, they'll be available through, yeah. through Bookshop. Great, great. That's a wonderful way of, of getting books yeah. safely. And and so your independent local bookstore. bookstores. Okay. Chris, thank you for having us. I've got to cut out. <laughs> Chris, Susan, thank you. So thank you for much. setting yourself too. Thank yeah, you, all. Chris. This has thank been you. a, and I, I want to thank Gary and Sarah and Ursula because I sprang all of these questions on them and said, what do you think folks? And they all just said, great, we'll, you know, take one and two and we'll see how it works out. And it's been wonderful because you really developed a dialogue and I, I learned so much from listening to you. And um, it was here. great. Thank you. Thank you all for being Thank you for the great for questions. Up with yeah. the questions. Yeah. It was fun. It was really very fun. And um, I, I hope, Chris, it brings you a lot of business and a lot of uh, interest. I hope so. But yeah. thanks to sure. thanks for letting me do this. Thanks to Sisters of Crime, too, right. for allowing me to do this. And I really hope to uh, do it again. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. So long, folks. Bye-bye. <laughs>